Hello, Mark. I'm Amy, and my number is 49. Uh, I'm going to read Martin Pistrius' How My Mind Came Back to Life and No One Knew. And I am junior. Filmed August 2015 at Tech KC. Martin Pistorius, How My Mind Came Back to Life and No One Knew. Subtitles and transcript selected language English. Imagine being unable to say, I'm hungry, I'm in pain, thank you, or I love you. Being trapped inside your body, a body that doesn't respond to comments. Surrounded by people, yet utterly alone. Wishing you could reach out to connect, to come forward, to participate. For 30 long years, that was my reality. Most of us never think twice about talking, about communicating. I thought a lot about it. I've had a lot of time to think. For the first 12 years of my life, I was a normal, happy, healthy little boy. Then everything changed. I contracted a brain infection. The doctors weren't sure what it was, but they treated me the best they could. However, I prog progressively got worse. Eventually, I lost my ability to control my movements, make eye contact, and finally, my ability to speak. While in hospital, I desperately wanted to go home. I said to my mother, when home. Those were the last words I ever spoke with my own voice. I would eventually fail every test for mental awareness. My parents were told I was as good as not there, a vegetable, having the intelligence of a three-month-old baby. They were told to take me home and try to keep me comfortable until I died. My parents, in fact, of uh, in fact, my entire life, family's lives become consumed by taking care of me the best they knew how. Their friends drifted away. One year turned two, two year two turned three. It seemed like the person I was supposed to begin to disappear. The Lego blocks and electronic circuits I loved as a boy were put away. I had been moved out of my bedroom into another more practical one. I had become a ghost, a faded memory of a boy people once knew and loved. Meanwhile, my mind began knitting itself back together. Gradually, my awareness started to return, but no one realized that I had become I had come back to life. I was aware of everything, just like any normal pe any normal person. I could see and understand everything, but I couldn't find a way to let anybody know. My personality was entombed within a seemingly silent body, a vibrant mind hidden in plain sight within a chrysalis. The stark reality hit me that I was going to spend the rest of my life locked inside myself totally. Oh, this is, uh, I was trapped with only my thoughts for company. I would never be rescued, no one would ever show me tenderness. I would never talk to a friend, no one would ever love me. I had no dreams, no hope, nothing to look forward to, well, nothing pleasant. I lived in fear and, to put it bluntly, was waiting for death to finally release me, expecting to die all alone in a care home. I don't know if it's truly possible to express in words that it's like not to be able to communicate. Your personality appears to vanish into a heavy fog and all your emotions and desires are constricted, stifled and muted within you. For me, the worst was the feeling of utter powerlessness. I simply existed. It's a dark it's a very dark place to find yourself because in a sense, you have managed. Other people controlled every aspect of my life. They decided what I ate and when, whether I was laid on my side or strapped into my wheelchair. I always spent my days post position in front of the TV watching Barney reruns. I think because Barney is so happy and jolly, and I absolutely wasn't. It made so it made it so much worse. 
I was completely powerless to change anything in my life or people's perceptions of me. I was a silent, invisible observer of how people behaved when they thought no one was watching. Unfortunately, I wasn't only an observer. With no way to communicate, I became a perfect victim, a defenseless object, seemingly devoid of feelings that people used to play out their dark darkest desires. For more than 10 years, people who were changed with my care abused me physically, verbally, and sexually. Despite what they thought, I did feel. The first time it happened, I was shocked and filled with disbelief. How could they do this to me? I was confused. And what had I done to deserve this? Part of me wanted to cry, another part wanted to fight. Hurt, sadness, and anger flooded through me. I felt worth this. There was no one to comfort me, but neither of my parents knew this was happening. I lived in terror, knowing it would happen again and again. I just never knew when. All I knew was that I would never be the same. I remember once listening to Winnie Houston singing, No matter what they take from me, they can't take any away my dignity. And I thought to myself, You want to bet? Perhaps my parents could have found out and could have helped, but the years of constant caretaking, having to wake up every two hours to tell me, combined with them essentially grieving the loss of their son, have taken a toll on my mother and father. Following yet another heated argument between my parents, in a moment of despair and desperation, my mother turned to me and told me that I should die. I was shocked. But as I thought about what she had said, I was filled with enormous compassion and love for my mother, yet I could do nothing about it. There were many moments when I gave up, sinking into a dark vice. I remember one particularly low moment. My dad left me alone in the car while he quickly went to buy something from the store. A random stranger walked past, looked at me, and smiled. And he smiled. I may never know why, but a simple act, the fleeting moment of human connection, transformed me, uh, transformed how I was feeling, making me want to keep going. My existence was tortured by monoton monotony, a reality that was often too much to bear. Along with my thoughts, I constructed intricate fantasies about ants running across the floor. I taught myself to tell the time by noticing where the shadows were. As I learned how the shadows moved as the hours of the day passed, I understood how long it would be before I was picked up and taken home. Seeing my father walk through the door to collect me was the best moment of the day. My mind became a tool that I could use to either close down to retreat from my reality or enlarge into a gigantic space that I could fill with menaces. I hoped that my realities would change and someone would see that I had come back to life. But I had been washed away like a sandcastle, we are too close to the waves, and in my places, uh, in my place was the person people expected me to be. To some, I was Martin, a vacuum shell, the vegetable, deserving of harsh words, dismissal, and even abuse. To others, I was a tragically brain-damaged boy who had grown to become a man. Someone they were kind to and cared for, good or bad, I was a blank canvas on to which different versions of myself were project. It took someone new to see me in a different an aromatherapist began coming to the care home about once a week, whether it's through intuition or her attention to details that others failed to notice. She became convinced that I could understand what was seen, what was being said. She urged my parents to have me tested by experts in augmentative and alternative communication. And within that year, I was beginning to use a computer program to communicate. It was accelerating but frustrating at, ten, at times. I had so many words in my mind that I couldn't wait to be able to share them. Sometimes I would say things to myself simply because I could. In myself, I had a ready audience. 
and I believed that by expressing my thoughts and wishes, others would listen too. But as I began to communicate more, I realized that it was in fact only just the beginning of creating a new voice for myself. I was thrust into a world I didn't quite know how to function in. I stopped going to the care home and managed to get my first job making photocopies. As simple as this may sound, it was amazing. My new world was re really exciting but often quite overwhelming and frightening. I was like a man child and as libertine as it often was, I struggled. I also learned that many of those who had known me for a long time found it impossible to abandon the idea of marking they had in their heads. While those I had only just met struggled to look past the image of a silent man in a whole church. I realized that some people would only listen to me if that I was in line with what they expected. Otherwise, it was disregarded and they did what they felt was best. I discovered that true communication is about more than merely physically conveying a message. It is about getting the message heard and respected. Still, things were going well. My body was slowly getting stronger. I had a job in computing that I loved and had even got Koyak, the dog I had been dreaming about for years. However, I longed to share my life with someone. I remember staring out the window as my dad drove me home from work thinking I have so much love inside of me and nobody to give it. Give it to. Just as I had resigned, Myself to being single for the rest of my life, I made a job. Not only is she the best thing that has ever happened to me, but John helped me to challenge my own misconceptions about myself. John said it was through my words that she found love with me. However, after all I had been through, I still couldn't shake the belief that nobody could truly see beyond my dis disability and accept me for who I am. I also really struggled to comprehend that I was a man. The first time someone referred to me as a man, it stopped me in my tracks. It felt like looking around and asking, who? Me? That all changed with John. We have an amazing connection and I, heard, and I learned how important it is to communicate openly and honestly. I felt safe and it gave me the confidence to truly say that I, what I thought. I started to feel whole again, a man worthy of love. I began to reshape my destiny. I spoke up a little more at work. I exerted my need for independence to the people around me. Being given a means of communication changed everything. I used the power of words and will ch challenge the pre preconception of the those around me and those I had for myself. Communication is what makes us human, enabling us to connect on the deepest level with those around us, telling our own stories, expressing wants, needs, and desires, or hearing those of others by really listening. All this is how the world knows who we are, so who are we without it? True communication increases understanding and creates a more caring and compassionate world. Once I was perceived to be an inanimate object, a mindless phantom of a body in a wheelchair. Today I'm so much more. A husband, a son, a friend, a brother, a business owner, a first class honors graduate, a keen amateur photographer. It is my ability to communicate that has given me all this. We're told that actions speak louder than words, but I wonder, do they? Our words, however we communicate them, are just as powerful. Whether we speak the words with our own voices, type them with our eyes, uh, with our eyes, or communicate them non-verbally to someone who speaks them for us, words are among our most powerful tools. I have come to you through a terrible darkness, uh, pulled from it by caring souls and by language itself. The act of you listening to me today brings me far farther into the light. We are shining here together. If there is one more difficult, most difficult obstacle to my way of communicating, it is that sometimes I want to shout and others simply to whisper words of love or gratitude. 
It all sounds the same, but if you will, please imagine these next two words as warmly as you can. Thank you. Applause.